Over the last couple of months, we've done a lot of really hard science. We made real cold fire, rainbow gecko tape, a frosting robot, microfluidic flow cells, and a maglev laser table. And later this month, I've got some even harder projects I'm finishing up that I've been working on for years. Frankly, I needed a break. So this week is going to be a bit different and hopefully a little bit more relaxed. Today we're going to look at a hobby I use to stay sane, which is making titanium chopsticks. I've made a lot of artsy things over the years, and while wood was my go-to material of choice, ever since we got the new metal lathe, chopsticks have become my moment of zen. I especially love them because they're not only stunning, but they make for incredible birthday presents for my friends, and titanium really isn't that expensive. 50 bucks worth and you get enough material to make 7 or more pairs of chopsticks. And considering I've seen people sell these for 100 bucks or more a pair on Etsy, that's great value. It's also great machining practice, as anytime you've got to make more than one of something, the challenge to maintain precision so that they match is far greater. So first I'm going to take you through the process of making these, and then we're going to talk in depth about how I get these incredible colors. There's actually a lot of surprisingly interesting science that goes into how those colors are formed, which we'll talk about later. Let's hop right in and get started. For all the work you'll see today, I'll be using a fresh half-inch carbide insert. Steel can cut titanium, but carbide just makes this much easier, and I find gives a nicer finish if you're careful. After mounting some titanium in my three-jaw chuck, we're going to start with the facing cut. For now, you don't need a lot of the titanium sticking out, an inch or so is plenty. Titanium is a very bendy metal, so when we go to turn it, we have to add a live center for tailstock support, so that way we can carve the pointy end of our chopsticks without it flexing out of the way. After the facing cut, I mounted my drill chuck and center drill into the tailstock. This was used to make a small divot that the live center can seat into. With that done, the titanium can be extended much further out of the chuck, and the live center is added. It's important that you get everything running as true as physically possible before you start turning. So if there's a bit of wiggle when you turn on the lathe, stop, adjust the tailstock, and retighten everything. Once you're happy with how things are running, we can set our compound angle. For my lathe, this is done with two bolts, and I typically set the indicator to either 1 or 2 degrees for chopsticks. 2 degrees goes faster and is very usable, but 1 degree will give a longer, more elegant taper. Choose whatever you feel. Most of this process is done by how you're feeling about the piece, so make it your own and adjust however you want. Lock your angle in, and then we can start cutting. Cutting titanium, especially a piece this thin and bendy, is best done slowly. I usually take no more than 5 thou passes, which lets you slowly develop your taper. When you're getting close to having your whole taper established, you'll want to change how you take your cuts. Normally for the first few, I'm pretty aggressive with how quickly I'm moving the carriage back and forth to take my cuts, but that doesn't give a very good surface finish. For the last pass, you'll want to slow down how fast you're moving everything, and try and maintain as even of a speed as possible. My lathe doesn't have power feed to cut tapers, so it takes a bit of practice to do this by hand and get good results. If it's not perfect, that's okay, we'll be sanding and adding other ornamentation in a moment, but the better this is, the less work you have to do later. For this particular pair, I felt like adding a little bit of extra grip, as titanium can be slippery and no one likes dropping their ramen. You'll want to reposition your cutter to be pointing directly at the metal so that it leaves nice triangular impressions. Move the cutter to line up with the end of the chopstick, and then set your dial on your horizontal control wheel to zero, so that you have a reference. Then advance the wheel by some increment, here I chose five divisions, and take a light cut by plunging the tool into the titanium slowly. Then back out the tool, move another five divisions, and repeat. Now, because we need to make two identical chopsticks, we need to do this whole same process to the other one before we do anything else. This makes it so that our angle will be identical as we haven't moved the compound, and will let us make any necessary adjustments to the back ends afterwards. It can be a bit tricky to make things match, so take your time and use a pair of calipers to regularly take measurements. Make sure that your taper is the same length, and that the grooves line up properly, and that you have the same number of grooves. Before we work on the back ends, move the chopsticks to be much further into the chuck so it doesn't flop around, and use a file to round out the pointed end and remove the divot we added earlier. Now for the back ends, we start by making sure that the pair are the same length. When you order titanium, they don't cut them all to be perfectly the same length, so we need to make a few small adjustments before we carve the rest of the ornamentation on the back. Stand both chopsticks up on a piece of mechanically flat metal. There's lots of parts on the lathe that fit this description, but use whatever you have. Then figure out how much you need to remove from one of the pair to make them even. With those adjustments done, we can go back to decorating. I'm going to carve a little flower bud on the end, but you can use whatever you feel like. Round them out, carve rings, it's art, so there's nothing mandatory at this point. I adjusted the compound angle to be 20 degrees, and with just a small amount of the end sticking out of the chuck, I started taking passes. I stopped when the end wasn't a sharp point, but still had a small blunt tip remaining. I adjusted the angle of the tool to cut the right sort of triangle to complete the lower part of the bud shape, and after lining up the tool, I just plunged it in slowly. 
When the shape was basically how I wanted it, I moved on to adding two more grooves below this. Again, I set my dial to zero, but this time I took a larger step of about 20 divisions. Again, the tools plunged into the work to make a groove. This is repeated a second time to make a second groove the same way. At this point, all that's left is to use a file to round out the edges, and to make the ends domed and get the shape I want. Repeat this with a second chopstick, and ta-da, you've got a beautiful pair almost ready for coloring. The last step is sanding. Because I chose to add this grippy texture, I need to go in with some folded sandpaper and break all the little edges so that it isn't sharp when you put it in your mouth. Then just general sanding on the rest of the piece to remove any scratches and get it all looking shiny and nice. The better job of this you do, the better the colors will be in a moment, so be sure to take your time and do a good job. Don't forget to turn the piece around and get the back end as well. After that, I rinsed the chopsticks off camera and gave them a little wipe with some isopropanol to remove any oils that would contaminate the surface. At this point, it's important not to touch the metal as any oil from your hand will either mess with the color formation or burn a permanent version of your fingerprint into the pattern, which if that happens, you'll probably need to re-sand everything and start the coloring process again. So you'll notice I handle everything with a paper towel to prevent that or only grab areas I don't intend to add color to. Now, there's two ways to get the colors that chemically do the same thing, but in two different ways that give different looks. Fire and electricity. We're going to start with my preferred method, which is a blowtorch, but we're going to come back to electricity in a moment, as it has a lot of advantages over the fire method, but also some downsides. It's really a dead simple process, and you just aim the torch at the metal and let it rip. You want to keep the torch moving, as heating one area too fast will make the colors appear too quickly, and often you end up overshooting the color you were aiming for. The colors always appear in the same order, and we'll talk about why in a second. It starts with a light yellow, then gets more bronze, then pinkish, then purple, then vibrant blue. Once you hit blue, it'll start to lighten past that point, and eventually it'll hit a silvery white. If you keep going, you can get another round of colors, but they're usually muted comparatively. So what's happening here, and why is titanium so magically colorful all of a sudden? Well, we're really just growing a thin layer of titanium dioxide, which has interesting optical properties. Titanium isn't actually the only metal that'll do this, and steel works as well. By growing a thin film of iron oxide on the surface of steel, it can also be made to have a fantastic blue color. Though, titanium usually has more vibrant colors, and it's easier to get this to work. The reason this works is because of something called thin film optics. With both titanium and steel, the powder form of the oxides are just a solid opaque color, white for titanium or red or black for iron respectively. But in these thin layers, they're actually reasonably transparent. The thin films that grow also happen to be just about as thick as the wavelength of visible light, which gives rise to really interesting optical effects. To understand this, let's first think about what happens when you shine a light beam into water. When the light changes mediums, that is, goes from propagating in air to propagating in water, the beam is bent at a specific, slight angle. This is known as refraction, and is why when you put something like a chopstick in water, the bit sticking out of the water doesn't line up with the image in the water. At the same time, some of the light doesn't actually enter the water at all and is just reflected off the surface. The other important thing to know is that the amount that the light is bent is also dependent on its color. We can see this when we shine a white light through a prism and is why light spreads out into a rainbow. Different colors are bent different amounts when they're refracted through the same material. The same thing is happening with the titanium dioxide films. But with the titanium, the layer is super thin and has the wonderfully reflective backing of the titanium metal. Now when a light beam hits the surface, some will be reflected immediately, while some will penetrate and be reflected off the titanium. This introduces a very slight time delay between the light that's reflected immediately and the light that had to go all the way through and back out. Light has wave-like properties, and as such, it can interfere with itself. Picture this sort of like ripples in a pond. In areas where two ripples overlap, they can either get bigger or smaller depending on how they're lined up. If two peaks line up, you get a bigger peak for a moment that's the sum of both. If two valleys line up, you get a valley that's deeper. If a peak and a valley line up, you may get still water for a moment. You can actually see this happen with light really easily, and this was first demonstrated with the classic double slit experiment. The idea is that when you shine a light through a pair of thin slits, it behaves just like the pair of ripples on a pond. In areas where the two waves add constructively together, you get a bright spot, and in areas where they add together destructively, you get darkness. This gives the characteristic interference pattern of lines. One interesting thing to notice is just like the refraction example, this behavior changes slightly by color. So using different colored lasers, you can see that as you move through the spectrum towards blue, the pattern compresses and would continue to get smaller as you approach UV light. Or if you use a white light, you get rainbow bands where red is further out and blue is closer to the middle for the same reason. 
With our layers of titanium, that time delay caused by the light having to go through the titanium dioxide makes the light behave in the same way as if there were two beams interfering. As the layer gets thicker, there's this sweet spot where a particular color of light always happens to bounce and add together to be constructive, while everything else adds together to be destructive. So to us, this looks like the metal being a specific bright color. This is actually the same reason why soap bubbles and oil films look iridescent sometimes. And if you want to see this for yourself, all you need is a tray of water and some thin oil that will spread over the water nicely. I found that bacon grease happens to work especially well for this. You want nice soft light, not direct light, and a small drop of oil on the tip of a skewer or glass rod. When you stand at the right angle and touch the rod to the surface of the water, the oil will spread out and for a moment that thin film effect is obvious. The colors are changing because the thickness of the oil is changing as it spreads out, which adjusts how the light is interfering with itself. In this case though, the second reflection happens at the boundary between the water and oil, instead of bouncing off the titanium. With bubbles, it's the inner and outer surface of the liquid that are the two reflective layers. In this case, so long as the layer is the right thickness, you can select for any particular color you want, which is actually the basis for things like dichroic mirrors that we've used in previous videos. So now that we know it's the thickness of the oxide and interference of light that controls the color, a more controlled way to do this is to use electrolysis. Let's set up a little electrolysis cell to see this in action. Here I'm using a solution of sodium carbonate, also known as washing soda. I didn't use any particular amount, and I literally just threw some in. The electrolyte doesn't even really matter, and this will work with just about anything, but I would avoid things with chloride in them. Not because it'll interfere, but because you run the risk of releasing a bit of chlorine, which is definitely not good for you. Hence the choice of sodium carbonate. I've prepared a piece of titanium by first sanding and cleaning it, and then connecting it to the anode, which is the positive wire of my power supply. I'm using another scrap piece of titanium for the cathode, and both are simply placed into the electrolyte solution. When we turn on the power, very quickly a layer of oxide will form on the titanium. But once that oxide layer forms, it very quickly stops growing as the layer itself inhibits the reaction. To grow a thicker layer, we need to increase the voltage. As we do this, we're providing more energy to the reaction to overcome that passivating effect of the growing layer. Once the layer gets thick enough and the voltage is high enough, we start seeing colors form. The nice thing with this is that once you've dialed in a color you like, you can keep growing the same color on piece after piece of titanium by leaving the voltage unchanged between runs. This chart shows a rough approximation of what color you'll get at which voltages, and it's reasonably accurate, but keep in mind it's, it'll vary based on the electrolyte you choose and the concentration so you will have to experiment a little bit. But let's walk through the whole spectrum. As with the flame method, it starts yellow at around 5 to 15 volts, slowly getting more bronze until you get purple at around 25 volts. By about 30, my power supply maxed out, but it's more than sufficient to get a beautiful blue color. To get the higher voltages, I'm using the DC to DC voltage converter from my gel electrophoresis setup. It can't do low voltages, so it skips pretty quickly to the second yellow. As I continue to crank the voltage, we eventually get this phenomenal red color. And then as we pass 100 volts, we eventually get a really gorgeous purple, and then finally a dark green. One thing that's really fun is to crank the voltage really high and then dunk the part and slowly pull it out to get a rainbow effect. It takes a second for the oxide to grow, so if you remove part of the metal, only the bit that's still in the liquid will continue to grow. And if you're ever not happy with the color, you can always just sand it off and try again. The best part is, unlike a dye or a stain or paint, Titanium dioxide is an incredibly hard material and it's very well attached to the surface, so it's quite permanent unless you really go out of your way to scratch it, and at that point you're scratching the metal itself. All in all, no matter what technique you use, the end result is going to be a gorgeous set of chopsticks which anyone would love as a present. They require only the most basic tools if you've already got a metal lathe and are an especially good first project as you will learn a lot. To go with this set, I also whipped up a little chopstick rest out of my favorite material, Delrin. A few minutes with a file to give it a flat bottom, and the set was complete and ready to be given to my friend. So thanks for coming on this journey through my little hobby. I know that was probably a lot more information than you thought you were going to get when you clicked on the video, but if you made it this far, thanks for sticking around, and I hope you enjoyed. I'd planned on it being a much shorter video, but when it came time to talk about how the titanium colors worked, I realized it was a much deeper rabbit hole than I'd originally intended. As always, I need to say a huge thank you to the patrons and supporters of the channel who make these videos possible. If you've enjoyed, be sure to subscribe and ring that bell to see when I post new videos, and if you're looking for more of the artsier things I do, then leave me a comment or follow me on Instagram to see these sorts of projects more often. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.